Good evening, everybody. Um, we'll be starting in about 15 or so minutes time. Um, there is a little box over by the teas and coffees, over by the windows, with some pens and papers. So if you have a burning question and you thought, oh, I really wanted to ask that but haven't sent it in, um, we will probably have a little bit of time at the end to go through some questions that you guys have come up with. So feel free to jot your question down, pop it in the box, and uh, yeah, we'll hopefully get to them towards the end of the hour.
if you do have any questions uh, tonight that you haven't submitted um, via email or or Twitter or social media or anything like that, there is a box over by the windows, just by the teas and coffees, pens and paper over there as well. Uh, so if we've got time at the end, we will get to those questions. If you just jot down your question and your name, and then we'll come to you with the mic so you can ask a question when we get to it. We'll be starting in about five minutes' time.
We've got half a panel at the moment. Yeah, they come. Has everybody submitted a question to the little box on the side if they've wanted to? If not, there, there is still time if you want to go and pop something in if you haven't already sent a question in. And if we have time, if you pop your name on it, we'll be able to give you the mic at the end and ask our panel a question too. Okay, no, good evening. Welcome, everybody, to our second fans forum of the season. Thanks a lot for braving the weather and coming out. It's absolutely freezing, isn't it? So well done to everybody that is here. And a big hello as well to everybody watching at home, probably in the warm on Argyle TV as well. Uh, it's a, a, a kind of interesting night in store, I imagine, today. Lots to talk about. Um, obviously, we are now a, a fair chunk into the championship season. And I think most people will agree it's been pretty fun so far, the opening 18 matches of this season. So lots to talk about there, but also off the pitch as well um, with the new mission that came out uh, about a month ago, or the new five-year plan with that ambition to be challenging the top end of the championship table with ambitions, of course, for the Premier League was the nice headline in there. Uh, and just 10 days ago, we released our financial statement for the 2022-23 season as well. So there's a lot of questions here that have come in over the last couple of days, which is superb. And the panel alongside me here, who I'll introduce you to in just a moment, will be able to answer all of those. Um, thanks a lot for sending them in. Lots of debate to come. And as I said, you can still pop a question in the box that we've got 
um, here in the room as well if you've, if you've got one burning that you, th you didn't submit beforehand. Um, that's going to be the format of this evening. We'll be going through answering the questions that have come in here. And if we've got time at the end, we will then have a, a roving mic with those questions that have been submitted by you guys. Uh, but let me introduce you to the panel of gentlemen alongside me. I'll, I'll start with right next to me, the Director of Football, Neil Dewsnip. We've got Chief Executive Andrew Parkinson, Chairman Simon Hallett, Board Director Paul Byrne. And uh, we've also got David Ray, who is our Head of Finance. And it, it is there that we are going to start. Uh, David Ray is going to talk us through the financial statement that was released just over a week ago. David. Thank you. Right. Um, hands up then, who's read it? Oh, <laughs> you can be honest. <laughs> no, um, my task now is to try and bring some colour to that document, really. Um, and, re and in line with our view, our value of transparency, um, show you what's really going on at Argyle um, in the books and records, the really exciting stuff. So what I've done is I've pulled together a few slides which should be on the screen. Um, around the room and on the, on the screen for you, those of you at home who are watching as well. So what I wanted to do first is just take an opportunity um, to reflect on the previous mission, which was to become a sustainable championship football club and look at what we've achieved since that mission was set. So um, what I've got on the screen is divisional status and position in the league. Uh, and then I've got our total income and our total player costs on there as, as, as well. So we set this mission, well, the board set this mission to be a sustainable championship football club. I think that was pretty ambitious given that we're in League Two at the time. And I think if you look at the accounts prior um, to that mission being set, we were losing a lot of money as well. So it was a bit, <laughs> we had to turn it around and get it going in the right direction. And it's been a fantastic story. And I think this graphic shows that really well. Um, something that we've tried to do is grow our income streams in order to provide more money to the football team, um, to the coaching staff. Um, <laughs> and they are they're then able to invest in the football team. And then that hopefully gives rise to fantastic results on the pitch. Um, so what you can see is um, year on year, aside from the year where we had a salary cap in place, we were able to increase those player wage costs. Um, and up to last year where, um, I think you can see on the screen there, total, um, total player costs were around four million pounds. Now, what I would say there, although that was a large increase on the previous year, that is still a fantastic achievement that we managed to win the league. When, if you were to compare us with many of our competitors in the division, I think you'd see that our player costs were around a third or half uh, of those competitors. So really credit to Neil and the rest of the coaching staff and of course the players on an amazing achievement last year. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this year's results. So um, what you can see there is that we achieved turnover or total income of 15 million pounds. That's a record for Plymouth Argyle. Uh, another brilliant achievement. That how was that done? Um, well, a combination of a really diversifying, so increasing the number of revenue streams that we had, but also enhancing those existing revenue streams. So to give some examples, the return of concerts to Home Park. We had two major concerts last year. Same again coming up this summer. We've got another big concert with Take That coming. Um, attendances. We had a full house pretty much every week, so brilliant support throughout the season. Hospitality, this room is absolutely heaven on every game. So again, all of that contributed to those record levels of income. Um, what you will notice is that as we move down, the numbers in brackets, what that means is it's a negative number, so a, a loss for the year. So if you look at the bottom, we lost 3.4 million um, for the, the financial year, and that's what people often take away from the statements. But if you actually look and, re and read them in a little bit more detail, you, you notice that there are a number of what I would describe as sort of non-cash adjustments. So um, you've got these word depreciation and amortization, which anyone who's listened to price of football uh, probably knows what that means. But that is basically a cost that you realize over a period of time on assets that were invested in um, some time ago, 
But if we looked at the underlying operations for the year, uh, we lost 1.7 million last year. Uh, there were some one-off items which led to that loss arising. Um, we paid some bonuses and some contingent payments uh, which were triggered by the promotion. That included also a payment to a bank. Uh, that was a legacy payment. We were fully aware of it. We knew it was coming. We knew it was a cost that would arise on promotion. And there were other uh, more operational costs, such as the fact that shirts went on sale, I think it was the 2nd of July, um, rather than going uh, on sale in May or June. Um, so that obviously that also results in a slight difference. But um, despite making a loss last year, sustainability remains a key pillar of our strategy moving forward. Over the, uh, over the overall period of the mission there, I've put that statement that I just showed you on the previous slide. Um, I've included all of the previous four years on the slide on the screen. Um, and what you can see there is that EBITDA, that operational aspect. If you look at it over the period of the mission, yes, we lost money last year. But in the years prior to that, operationally, we were actually generating money. And that was able to be reinvested into the club, uh, which has ultimately contributed to our growth over the years. So are we operating sustainably? Yes. But if you look at it in a snapshot in time, we made a loss. The next li line on that chart that I wanted to just show you is this net assets. That's shareholder funds. Um, so if the yellow, the, the yellow line should just drop, drop down in a second. Um, that's increased over time. That's as a result of people like Simon, um, Argyle Green, putting money into the football club. And what we've been able to do is invest that in fixed assets, um, which I've summarized on the next slide. And during the last year, we invested over five million pounds in fixed assets. And there's a selection on the screen there. So Harper's, the acquisition of Harper's Football Center, uh, the implementation of a big screen at Home Park. We've acquired more land around ha Home Park Stadium, which presents opportunities for the future. Um, continuing our green initiatives with solar panels on the roof uh, of the Mayflower Grandstand. That was increased uh, in summer 2022. Um, and then also we've made improvements at the rear of the Mayflower Grandstand. Finally, um, we've started to once again invest in players um, by spending transfer fees on them. So all of those assets there will continue to serve the club as we move into this next chapter and under this new new mission that was that was announced a couple of weeks ago to be a sustainable top six championship club with Premier League aspirations within five years. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions here um, which touch around that, that mission. Thank you. Thank you, David. All very concise. I was supposed to only last five minutes, but you get David talking about finance and money. And he keeps going, but no, thank you very much. Um, on to the questions then. And the first question is exactly on what we've just been talking about there, David. So it, it's coming from Toby. I don't know whether you want to add anything more onto this, uh, but the, it, it highlights a loss in the accounts and whether you can explain the reasons why. You kind of have gone into it. Do you want to go in any more detail at all? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's what I just described, really, that there were these... A selection of non-recurring items, things that I wouldn't see, expect to see on there every year. Well, unless we go to the Premier League this year, but <laughs> wishful thinking, I think. Um, so that's what results in that. <laughs> that's what results in that operational, operational loss I described. But I would just draw people back to the fact that it hasn't been like that every year over the period, and we are operating sustainably as a football club. Toby continues his question as well, um, and he says, "I presume." Uh, that the budget would have been set out at the start of the year, and that was contingent upon promotion slash winning the league, which would, would have maybe been a target. Given that, that this was the case, were these results A, better than budgeted, B, worse than budgeted, or C, sustainably in line with the budget? I think we can probably cross out B. <laughs> I think um, we, sat, we sit down. I have to sit down and present to the board. They get over three hours of me talking rather than seven or eight minutes. <laughs> um, we set, and we set a budget which is sustainable. So that's typically around operating enough money coming in to match the money that's going out the door. Um, we adjust the figures accordingly um, so that that is a sustain sustainable budget for the upcoming year. If I'm honest, um, 
we didn't budget to get promoted. <laughs> um, that was a nice surprise. Um, we budgeted to finish in the playoffs, for example. We, we budgeted for high crowds, which enabled us to put more. We budgeted to have concerts. We budgeted to have everything else um, that was so brilliant last year and led to that record-breaking turnover for the football club. Um, but no, we didn't budget to get promoted. But equally, we knew the costs were there in the event that we, that we would get promoted. And getting to the championship is an, an unbelievable achievement for everyone. Uh, just so you guys know as well, you can dive in at any point on this. If you want to add to whatever anyone else is saying, I won't direct questions to people, uh, but this one's for you, Neil. No, I'm joking. Um, will the club, this is from Lewis Ayres, will the club invest in new advertising boardings? For example, the electronic ones that most clubs now have in the 92. So, Neil, do you want to go on that? No, <laughs> no I don't know. <laughs> I just wanted to apologise for getting promoted. Sorry. <laughs> Who was it? I think it's me, isn't it? If you told us in December you were going to get promoted, we'd have made sure we had the money available. <laughs> Are you going to tell everybody that you swore at me on that bus? <laughs> what have you done? All good stuff. Yes, Andrew. A, a, a Would you like to repeat the question? Advertising <laughs> hoardings um, from Lewis. So we'll be investing in new advertising hoardings, and he specifically mentions the the electronic LED ones. Um, yeah, as he says, a lot of clubs have that. Most clubs have that, and uh, we're, un we're we've cur currently got that under review. Uh, I think it's fair to say um, it will probably go ahead next year. So um, we're we're doing the feasibility of it. it does make sense, um, particularly in the championship. And so um, I think all things being equal, yes, we will have those in place for next year. Very good. Um, right, this is from Bob Searle. Um, will you enter the transfer market to spend what is needed on players needed to ensure that we don't go down and put the five-year plan on hold until the club have a firm footing in the championship? Um, he goes on to say, Bob, that um, he thinks 20 million was the sum that was mentioned for being in the championship for the next season. I'm sure we wouldn't want to lose out on any of that money. So this could be aimed in a few different directions. Who wants to take that on first? Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a bit multiple, <laughs> this. So, um, so we'll probably go across us here. So first of all, this, um, let me answer uh, the, the question about the uh, 20 million. So we don't get directly 20 million pounds from, for getting into the championship from the EFL. Uh, there is broadcasting revenue that is provided. But you've also got to remember there's an additional lot of costs that come with that. So. Um, undoubtedly, obviously, wages come, you know, player wages come into that. So there isn't an increase of £20 million pounds, uh, to the bottom line. So um, let's just kill that myth before we get any further. Um, as for, um, you know, the, the next stage, obviously, uh, in the um, January window, we'll do everything we can to improve the squad if we can improve the squad. So, um, and Neil will talk about this um, uh, you know, um, more fully in a, in a second, I'm sure. Um, so, you know, we we look at uh, we look at it all the time in terms of each transfer window. So, as, as soon as one window is uh, closed, we're always looking at what we do in the January one or the the summer one. And if we feel that there is the potential to improve the squad in areas, then we will certainly look at that. Shall I go? Uh, so. Uh, as Andrew said, we've been working on the January transfer window uh, pretty much since the last one shut back in the summer. So Ross Goodwin, who's our head of data analytics, and Jimmy Dickinson, our head of recruitment, spend every second looking for players that they believe uh, can improve our squad. Uh, they have already kind of formed uh, a target list, showed it to myself, uh, Andrew has been in those discussions as, as well. And probably as we sit here this evening, Stephen Schumacher is sat at home watching video clips of all those target players uh, because he obviously uh, is just, well, absolutely massive in that process. He's got to have final say on who he's comfy with and who he isn't. Uh, if we can actually get those players, uh, that's a real challenge because the players that we are obviously targeting right now uh, they're, they're quite talented, you'd expect that. Uh, they cost a lot of money, and our competitors also want the same players. 
So will we be trying to improve? Yes, absolutely. Do we have a plan? Yes. Uh, will we be able to carry it out? Hope so. Uh, and I guess that will go back towards how much finance we have available. And I suppose uh, maybe even Paul or Simon on this one around the, the part of the question that Bob mentioned around needing players or reinforcements or whatever to stay in the league to kind of carry on with the, the new mission that has been put in place. Does going down, for example, quash that? Um, no, the mission would remain if we got relegated. I happen to think we won't get relegated, and I don't think anybody here thinks we're going to get relegated. But um, when we uh, set out the five-year plan previously, we were in League Two. So to achieve the mission, we had to jump two leagues. So if we if we took a step backwards, I think it would be it would be a step backwards. <laughs> but um, I don't think it would mean that we'd have to reassess the mission. That that, that would remain. The question, um, when Bob talks about 20 million, I'm not sure if he was talking about revenues, as Andrew answered, or whether he was referring to the losses that championship clubs make. And we know that the average championship club loses half a million pounds a week, so 25 million a year. And I, and we are absolutely not going to be losing 25 million pounds a year. You know, as has been described, we're budgeting to break even. And our whole success so far, as David uh, uh, mentioned, has been by spending our money more smartly than other people, not by spending more money. In the championship, there's a correlation between uh, how much you spend and the number of points you get. But it's actually lower even than in League One. And in the bottom half of the championship, the correlation is even lower. So there are a lot of people spending a lot of money, but not spending it very well. We don't spend as much money, but we spend it very well. And that is what we will continue to do. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to Ian Lobb's question. Uh, it's around the Green Taverners. He says, please can you explain the long-term future plan in this five-year plan uh, and what will happen to this fantastic venue? Um, well, first of all, we think it is a great venue. Uh, if anyone, everyone's not aware, um, the current lease that is with the Green Taverners ends at, in, um, at the end of 2026, so a few years yet. Um, so obviously it's a, it's a great offer. At the right time, we'll discuss the future, um, and I'm sure there'll be a, a proposition that will meet the requirements of the people that are already in there and enjoying it as well. Any more to add? Brilliant stuff. Okay. Um, it wouldn't be a fans forum at Argyle without this question. It's from Tony Prout. Is consideration being given to increasing the ground capacity <laughs> in the long term? <coughs> exactly. <laughs> I.e., are we going to fill in the corners? I have been asked this question <laughs> since 2019, you and um, forward in uh, sort of like and um, I remember uh, uh, being answering it, and I thought, well, we're only getting crowds of 9,000, uh, and we're talking about filling in the corners. Um, obviously, now we're selling out every week, and um, you know, a consideration is being made to how we can increase the capacity. Um, it has to be amongst a lot of other things that we need to consider, which I'm sure lots of questions will come up about that. We've acquired land around the stadium, uh, which are long-term plays. Uh, we've obviously need to think about other, um, other things, such as the retail store, but un undoubtedly um, capacity is something we need to, to look at. As part of that, uh, we're we'll be undertaking, um, and we are undertaking a, um, a demand study to look at what the right capacity would be. Uh, that includes um, hospitality as well. So, um, as everyone will know, we're full here on a on a Saturday as well. So it's um, it's a dynamic that re we really need to understand uh, the price points, what the real demand will be, whichever league we're in as well, uh, and we need to make a play which is for the long-term future as well, not a three or four year um, situation, one that is going to be for um, the long, the long-term best future of the, of the club. So yes, it's under consideration. It won't, 
the results of that won't happen in the next uh, few months. I think it's more likely to be you know, towards next year that we'll, we'll have the answer to that because it's complex and we need to understand uh, how we might and how we should invest money. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for the question, Tony. It will come up every time, so we have to ask it. Um, sticking kind of with that theme, uh, and it's around tickets maybe more than the stadium, but uh, it's a question from Martin Jones who says, why are tickets for home and away matches not available sooner, i.e. longer in front of the game? Um, f uh, the away tickets um, is really governed by uh, the away club, and um, each... Uh, game has a different um, situation involved to it. So, for example, if we were playing um, David's club, um, Sunderland, uh, they may not know what the demand, what the demand uh, might be for an Argyle game ahead of it. So, putting the tickets on sale at that point might not be the right right thing to do. So, we're governed a lot by um, the away club, first of all. In terms of the home club, again, each game is very different. So, we have, for example, um, academy days, et cetera. Uh, the away team as well, we don't know how many they're going to be bringing. So, where do we put the segregation lines? Uh, and also, in terms of the ticket office itself, um, we've got to do it in a very structured way and make sure that it's done in an efficient way as possible so that we're doing it in, uh, you know, as we go along rather than trying to overwhelm everybody with, with tickets at the same time. So there's lots of different things involved. I think, um, obviously, again, it's different to where we had, you know, even a season ago where we still had walk-ups. We don't have that now. So, um, you know, we have to sort of um, um, evolve with where we are. But it, it's, it's probably the best way of doing things at the moment. Were you happy on Saturday, David? Yeah, because <laughs> we need to stay in the division. <laughs> so. um, okay, uh, we're kind of hopping all over the place with these questions, but um, this is one that's coming from Gary, which um, we, we kind of touched on a bit earlier, but uh, is aimed to you, Neil. Um, player reinforcements in January, we've kind of looked at it. Um, are we looking for any, especially on a defensive front? Uh, I think we're looking for opportunities to improve the squad. Uh, Stephen has strong ideas about where the priorities would be. Uh, forgive me, I'm not going to tell you what they are, but, but we're aware of those. Uh, I, I, interestingly, I think there's something like seven or eight clubs in the league conceded more goals than us, uh, one of which is Preston North End, just saying. <laughs> so... Uh, whilst I, I hear the question, I'm not so sure that's as big a deal as maybe uh, whoever asked the question thinks it may be. We're, we're just looking to improve the squad, aren't we? Improve the team. That was from Gary. Thank you, Neil. Um, so this is from Tony and, again, uh, from a guy called Andy Croydon. Uh, one of the questions in a recent Argyle survey asked if we would be interested in streaming a streaming service for the women's matches, is this something that we'll be looking into getting started at all? Um, I think it's fantastic, first of all, that uh, the women's team is going to come under uh, uh, the sort of jurisdiction, as it were, of, of the, the main body of the club. Uh, and, you know, the timing is uh, being well thought through and uh, next season it'll be great um, to do that. And I think uh, we'll, you know, I'm broadening the, the answer here, I know, but uh, we'll look to play some of the games at Home Park as well. And then we've obviously got to look forward to Brickfields where um, the, women, the women's team will have a home. So I think the timing is great. And as part of that, um, we'll also look at um, the streaming service. It's under consideration. Of course, you know, there's a d it, it's what the demand will be like that. And if there are enough people uh, wanting to subscribe and want to watch the game, then, of course, then it will be an easy decision to make. Sticking with the women's team as well, um, same, same man asking the question, Tony. Um, as a premium member of Evergreen, will I be able to put a percentage of the funds into the women's team? Because currently it's just the three sections with, without the women's team on there. Is that a consideration? 
Um, so, yes, Evergreen, um, again, broadening it slightly, Evergreen's been unbelievably successful for us. And in fact, um, it's just won an award, a sports award, um, and that's because um, it's, it's recognised as um, something that supporters can directly contribute so to and make uh, real um, differences to how, how we do. So, for example, in the academy, We've been able to put facilities and invest in facilities that otherwise wouldn't be there. We've been able to give things to the first team as well in terms of some of the facilities that wouldn't be there. And obviously, um, with the women's team coming under the, uh, the main body of the club, um, there will be the opportunity next year to be able to invest in the women's team. And, and I think that will be great for um, everybody. It's a further extension of Evergreen and really makes, makes uh, the connection between supporters and you know, what w we will hope will be a, a successful women's team um, really connected. Yeah, I, I just want to add one of my own here. Um, and I saw you nodding along to a lot of that, Simon, as well. The women's team coming under the, the umbrella or the jurisdiction or the ownership of the football club. Um, why? But also, what does it mean, I suppose, for not only the women's team, but also Argyle supporters and the club? Uh, well, it means for the women's team that they are, we are really only one Argyle. You know, the women's team was under the community trust as a convenience and to give them access to revenue streams. But, you know, it's always a little bit tricky. The trust is a separately uh, organized charity. Paul, Paul's on the, uh, what are you? Trustee. 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 Um, and so it was always a little bit awkward. So we thought it, you know, would be cleaner, more transparent to bring it under, under the club. Um, particularly, as Andrew said, at a time when we are investing heavily in the Brickfields project, which is for the benefit of our academy and for our women's team. So the timing was right to, you know, clean it up. Uh, and the response has been fantastic. You know, the players are enthused. Um, uh, we've been able to recruit new players with the prospect of, you know, having a permanent home, with the prospect of playing more at home park. And we had... 2060 turn up for uh, a cup game against, you know, not terribly good, but enthusiastic op opposition from Somerset. Um, so, you know, it's fantastic. If we're getting 2,000 people and maybe even more turn up, that's what it's going to do for the fans. It's going to give them another opportunity to see an Argyle team play at Home Park and in the future at the Brickfields. And the other thing I'd add is that Neil will be overseeing the football aspect as well. So, um, and you know, Neil can speak for himself here, but the, he's looking forward to, aren't you, the involvement in that? Very much. So those kind of uh, football discussions are already taking place. Uh, I'm working really closely with Ryan Perks, the, the current uh, head coach, uh, to get it in, into a position where we're ready for this transition. Very exciting, hey? Can watch another Argyle team. How good is that? Do you have any experience with women's soccer? Yeah. Soccer. Soccer. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I had an unbelievable experience in the Olympic Games, uh, being asked to uh, be the assistant coach to the Canadian ladies in the last Olympics, uh, and what I realised was I knew very little about the women's game, uh, and learned loads in so many different ways. Uh, they're ahead of us in many aspects, for example, in sports psychology. Uh, the sports science is quite uh, forward thinking and, and brought some lessons back to discuss with Stephen, uh, which we've adapted. Uh, so with uh, a little bit of luck, I think we would be able to put those messages into our women's program straight away. Uh, what I would say is we're, we're realistic. We're not, we're not about to be the best women's team in England. I think Chelsea have got that sorted out pretty strongly at the moment. Uh, but we're going to grow. We're going to grow sensibly. And I think the journey will be really exciting for the whole football club over the next few years. Thank you very much uh, for those answers. Right, a couple of quick fire ones here. Um, so I've seen a lot of uh, shirts in the crowd here at the moment. One of the questions that's come in from Tony says, gold printing peeling off Puma shirts. There's no question, question uh, there, so, well, but, but like it is clearly a problem um, seen, been raised. Well, um, first of all, I think the kit is uh, the best kit we've had for a, a long, long time. So um, 
and uh, we've sold record numbers of uh, shirts. Um, notwithstanding that, um, obviously Puma are a great uh, partner for us. Uh, we have had a few um, complaints, if that's the right word, about uh, some of that happening. We're working with them to address those. I've got to say, we've had very few returns, uh, so we don't see it as being a massive problem, but obviously, you know, there are some people who've had that experience. And of course, if anyone does have that, then uh, we will, um, you know, reimburse them. Um, so, you know, just to probably put the context of the, the shirts themselves, um, you know, it's uh, they've sold really well. I think there might be a question later on that, but um, maybe you give it now. <laughs> well, let's give it now. I've lost it, so um, I was uh, I was trying to look for it desperately here, but it's something around <coughs> amount of shirts that, yeah. are, that are available I, to be sold. I, I think the question was, could we have ordered more? And you know, we were a, a, a bit light on on doing that. So um, last year we sold ten thousand shirts. So. Um, we upped the order to 12,000. Last year, we sold 10,000 between May and August, and we sold 12,000 in July and August this year. So um, it was <laughs> unprecedented levels of sales. Um, we obviously put uh, another order in, um, and uh, those have arrived before Christmas. And I've got to say, we've already sold 60% of the new order. So um, if you want them, if you want them, go and get them now. Um, so. You know, I I think it's a careful balance as well because we obviously want to sell as many shirts as we possibly can, and it has been a fantastic shirt. But equally, what we don't want to do is order the wrong number of shirts and have them on the shelves because that is we're ordering that's cash out the business. So getting the balance is 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 very difficult. I think you can see though we've uh, endeavoured to get the right number, increase the number, and then uh, ensure that we, we're getting a supply back if, if uh, all else fails as soon as possible. I've just found the question. That's from Ross on that, exactly. But well Hopefully answered. I answered uh, the question. Uh, hopefully. Um, more quick fire. So um, probably for Neil, but anyone can jump in on this. Why? This is from Nick. Why do football teams take kickoff pass, take kickoff, pass it back, then play the ball upfield, and out into a fullback position. You, you struggled with that. I didn't did you? struggle with that. Yeah, sorry, Nick. <laughs> Why do football teams take a kickoff pass, kick off, pass it back, then play the ball outside to the opponent's fullback position, put it into the corner, basically? Okay, so not every team does that, but lots do, uh, and I think it's as simple as it's about territory, really. Right at the start of the game, there would be uh, a common sense around starting the game on the front foot. So, uh, as described by Charlie, player A passes to player B, who passes it back and it gets lumped down the side. Uh, that may go out of play, uh, and therefore the opposition are taking a throw in round about the edge of their own penalty area, which means that we're on the front foot, they've got a long way to go to our goal, and we're not gonna do anything silly in the first minute, which would create a problem for the rest of the game. Uh, there are other strategies uh, I've seen where there could be three, sometimes even four players in front of the ball and they just go for it. Okay, it's in that work about once in a zillion times. Uh, so yeah, where, where we're at is most teams will do what you see us do really. Except the ball never goes out if you're in Coventry, does it? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's, the, what's the probability of uh, regaining possession after the throw-in. So, so that you're in the opponent's third after lumping it forward and having it go out? Uh, I don't know is the honest answer, but most teams would logically throw the ball forwards because of where, where they are. So then it usually ends up back with Lewis Gibson and we've got the ball in and around the halfway line and we're off to attack. Did I get away with that? You got away with it as well as I asked the question. Um, <laughs> this is from Danielle. Will Argyle ever put blue light discounts for the NHS for season tickets? Um, we do a lot of discounts uh, right across the board. So um, the answer will be we're not going to introduce any more discounts. We're sold out, obviously, as well. Um, I think it's really important that we recognise as, as many um, 
different sectors as we possibly can do. But I, I think we've got to a point where uh, we're great value for, for coming in anyway. So I think, you know, average under 20 pounds. Um, and we go to, we're already going to clubs where it's, you know, 40 plus um, for, to watch as well. So I think um, value for money, I think we provide, I'm going to use the word product, but uh, a good product. And I, I think we're really there in terms of our discounts. Okay, um, thank you, Andrew. Uh, well, let's go into one about developing players uh, and the academy, and it kind of links into the the, biz, the the model of the club and 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 the plan going forward. So, um, n probably one for you, Neil, and then potentially anyone else that wants to come in. But how important is developing players um, and buying players for next to nothing, and then being able to sell them on? So it is an investment in a player. Um, so, yeah, how important is that in the, in the model from a football point of view to begin with? Well, first of all, pr producing a player who's a local player who goes through the academy from, let's say, the age of, uh, the age of 9, 10 and runs out on home park, uh, it is just an incredible achievement. The fans seem to like that. He's one of our own. I hear you singing. Uh, but, but it also represents, in my opinion, the heartbeat of the football club. Uh, does it feel a little bit nicer if Adam Randall scores? Possibly. Uh, so it's really important from that point of view. Uh, we're, we're working really, really hard all over Devon and Cornwall, uh, and, and we're going to widen that to the whole of the Southwest to try and attract the top talent. Uh, Andrew's referred to the investment in Brickfields. Uh, we think we can offer a better a service, a better development program for the players in the near future, uh, and it's already pretty good. So with that in mind, uh, we want to produce more Adam Randalls, more Michael Coopers, more Freddie Asakas. You, you get the idea, if we can. Uh, yeah, and I suppose the next part of that question is about, uh, there was a, a clause in it where they were saying about buying a younger player for next to nothing and then selling on. <laughs> so when you're having discussions with Neil as board members and people in charge of, of cash, um, how important is, is finding that sort of player and around those sort of discussions? I think that's the new approach that we've added this season, that we set aside an amount of money and basically said to the football people, to the recruitment people, to Ross and Jimmy in particular, your job is to create value out of this, I'm an investment guy, so forgive me, this portfolio of players and we will be in the player trading business. We're now in the player trading business. Now, player trading doesn't mean that you buy them in June and sell them in January. It means that you buy them in June, hopefully young, hopefully raw talent. And we use the fact that we've invested very heavily in our you know, really excellent coaching staff. So we think we can buy young players, make them better, and have them progress their careers somewhere else in exchange for a large amount of money for us. And that amount of money will be retained in the portfolio mostly. Some will come back into the club, but some will stay in the portfolio and we'll use it gradually to build up the value of the squad. And, you know, we've had obviously one big success already this year. Uh, so it is part, that combined with the academy, is part of a long-term plan to create value in the squad and some of those squad members will stay with us, some will leave, but that will enable us to buy you know, more talented, more expensive players and keep improving. Um, the, the other thing I would add though is um, I don't think that that per se means we're a selling club at all. So um, it does mean it's about value. So if we can have a, a better player um, and we can add to the squad and make us different, then that's a consideration. But equally, if we need that player, and that is going to make us better than if we sold them, then I think we would we would keep them. So, it, when the model isn't straightforward, you know, it's one that has to depend on what we need. Do we need a striker? Do we need a defender? Where can we get value by um, being in the market at the right time to get the maximum value or not? You know, so um, you know we'll have a, our own independent model in how we do that. It's probably worth probably worth saying as well that for the last this is not new, is it? You know the squads that we've had in the last three years have been greater than the value than we've been paying for them. You know David talked about what we spent on player 
players last year and that when you compare that against where we achieved and that's been the same for four years really on the bounce so it's not like we're suddenly breaking new ground it's only a continuation of the excellent data-led approach that we've had throughout yeah i mean taking last season as an example we obviously won the league and i reckon we had the budget the 11th 12th largest budget it's an unbelievable achievement by Neil, Shuri and all the rest of the staff. And we've done it year on year, haven't we, Paul? Yeah, so it's just building on that and building on that, really. And I think there's every confidence that we can do it. It's central to the way that the clubs run. I will follow on from that. Really well answered as well. Um, a question from Ben. And it's, it's, it's more specific into players. But um, he asks, are there any sell-on clauses or add-ons involved in the Morgan, Whitaker and Barley Mumba transfers? Well, you wouldn't expect me to answer that, <laughs> would you? <laughs> well, Ben tried his luck. Uh, no, I mean, obviously, player contracts have to remain confidential. Um, what I would say is in, in, in any uh, agreement, any deal that we do, um, it's about what's the best long-term interest of the club. So um, we're, we're going to make sure that uh, we get that dynamic right. You know, um, what, what what uh, happens with an individual remains with the individual, but it's whatever's in the best interest of the, of the club, and we'll make sure that that is the primary aim. Um, question here from Daryl. Uh, so it's, it's around the five-year plan, so we're going back to, to, to that, which is the big part, obviously, that was, was mentioned leading into this fans forum. Um, and this is for anybody to answer again. So the five-year plan of being a sustainable top six club within five years shows great ambition and is a reflection of how far we have come over the last five or so years. But given the spending power at the top end of the championship, is it realistically achievable without significant further investment? Could anybody think when we launched the five-year plan five years ago mm. that it was achievable in the same way? So I think the same dynamic exists here. We've been sensible, realistic, but ambitious. And we've been smart in our approach. And it's paid off. You know, there'd be people saying five years ago when we were in League Two, what do you mean a sustainable championship club? That sounds balmy. So I think it's good to have ambition. It's good to have realistic ambition. And I think the way that we've gone about things um, and the way that the club is top to bottom, whether it's investment in facilities, fan experience, or on the pitch, it's all contributing to getting better and better all the time. So I appreciate people might say, blimey, that seems a bit stretching. But look at what we've achieved over five years. And I think it's eminently eminently sensible to, to try and have that ambition to move forward in that way. Anyone else want to come in? Anyway? Yeah, I, you know, undoubtedly it's challenging, but I think one of the unifying things about having a mission is that everybody can get behind that, and that's not just staff who work at the club or the players, it's, it's the supporters too. Yeah, everything matters here. Um, so when we have a game on Saturday, you know, if we're one nil down, then everyone getting behind us makes that massive difference. So I think having aspiration, ambition is really important to, to where we go. And I think we can draw on past experience. The other thing in the wider, uh, from a wider perspective is, um, as every, everyone does know, the, there is regulation coming into, um, in, into um, the game. And that will mean that there will be um, limits to what um, teams can spend on wages, um, player wages. Um, some, uh, some clubs, as we know, already spend 100% of their income on, on wages, and that is going to be reduced. We're in a position where we're nowhere near that level. So there's going to be a, a, a top-down um, pressure on some of those clubs, and we're in a really good position to be able to capitalize on that because uh, we're not at that level. We can invest more. Uh, and will invest more, but it will mean that the if you if you like there will be a levelling of all that 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 difference. Uh, parachute payments remain a problem, uh, and will remain a problem for the clubs coming down um, to from the Premiership to that equality. But I think large large number of clubs are going to be um, in the same bracket as we will be in the next two or three years. So ju just to make it clear, the the mission says that we want to be a sustainable. Champ, uh, top six championship club. And what that really means is that we want to be competing not in the bottom half of the championship, but in the top half. And if you're competing in the top half, a couple of years you're going to have a 
a good streak, you're going to have a lucky streak, you're going to catch lightning in a bottle, and you're going to end up in the playoffs. And if you're in the playoffs, you've got a 25% chance of making it to the Premier League. And that's what we're trying to do. What we're not going to do is lose 25 million pounds a year in order to try to get automatic promotion. There you're competing against clubs that are spending 40 million pounds on individual players that are coming down with uh, parachute payments. And we are going basically to have uh, revenue streams, football budgets that I think are going to enable us to compete top half of the championship. But targeting automatic promotion is not really going to be feasible at the moment. No, nice round of applause. Um, you've all kind of mentioned in, in whilst talking about the the kind of the finances and stuff and being able to be able to come up with ways to maybe increase revenue or be clever with the way you do it. Question here from Kenneth Gibby says, uh, as it's the intention of Argyle to increase revenue opportunities, is it possible to stage international matches at home park? Uh, Kenneth goes on to say, thinking especially of England under 21s or England women matches, uh, England women's matches. Um, I mean, the we've got to look at all the opportunities that we may have. Um, so, you know, we've talked about concerts, or David talked about concerts before, and we've got to look at other wider um, opportunities that might be. Um, I think to do those things, um, it there are some uh, aspects that need to be considered. Logistics, as an example, so um, you know, airports, people flying in, that sort of thing. If you're playing. Um, you know where the, the away team's coming from, so it's it's uh, and also things like the the size of the pitch, um, the changing room facilities, all of those aspects. So I think it is something we should aspire to, but um, and it's probably something that's a little way off, but nonetheless we should be considering for the future. Um, a couple of more quick fire ones um, as we kind of get towards the end of the hour. I've got quite a few here from Nick Cole who submitted via the. Uh, via the box. Nick, do you want to say some of your questions? If we get a mic to you, or would you like me to read them out? No, you can read them out. I'll read them out? OK. So this is from Nick, who's wearing one of the brilliant uh, Plymouth Argyle home shirts. It's not peeling, and is it? It's not peeling, no. is it, Nick? No. <laughs> Nick, yeah. please stand up and show us it's not peeling. <laughs> uh, so uh, there are four here, but I think they should be quick, quite, quite quick fire. Um, coverings for the fan zone. I'm, I presume you, you mean not not enough on. Well, those, those umbrella things. Yeah. There, yeah. So when it rains, fans are getting wet. Uh, and if you want people to come a couple hours before the match, or you know, to have a few pints, just let them know where to go if it's raining. Um, I think on the facilities for the fan zone. Um, We've, we've got a few things that, um, I mean, it's undoubtedly improved the situation, as we all know. And, um, you know, I think we've got to go back to the, the facilities that we had just a couple of years ago in terms of toilets, uh, drink provision, etc. cetera. Um, and I think from a, the covering point of view, we'll take that away and look, look at that. I think I would add, because I think this might come up a bit later as well, that the intention is that uh, we're going to, on what's now called the Mayflower Quarter, which before was known as the Ice Arena Land. Um, there is going to be an extension of um, the fan zone there. So in um, January time, we'll be in a position to be able to extend that and we'll take covering into consideration then. The entertainment is fantastic. They're covered, we're not. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll take that away, Nick. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and just one other quick one from Nick as well. It's, it's a s similar thread, I suppose, with match day um, food and drink or uh, entertainment that you've mentioned before. So queuing uh, can sometimes be very long for food and drink um, in the concourse areas. Yeah, well, a uh, number of aspects here. First of all, um, there are not many football grounds, and I go to a lot of football grounds, where you do not have problems with queuing. Um, and, you know, we do have that kind of, I don't know how everyone manages to get a drink, go to the toilet, 15 minutes, you know, and do everything you need to do in that time. So that does present a challenge. Um, secondly, though, um, I think, you know, in terms of queuing, um, 
size of con size of the facilities we have um, probably was made for an another time. So generally, the concessions are quite small in terms of the um, the actual uh, space that we have in order to be able to do those. <coughs> Uh, over the last couple of years, we've made a lot of improvements to the speed. Believe it or not, we measure the average transaction time of how quickly uh, somebody is served, um, and that has improved. Um, but I would completely accept that if you, you wanted to come and get a drink and, and you wanted to be able to do it and have the right time, that there are still some challenges around that. Um, there's still some, a few challenges around quality, et cetera. But I think we're making big improvements all the time, and each year we've been able to demonstrate that. I'd just like to elaborate on that point that Andrew made there. We, one of our values is to be efficient and process oriented and as you know we've talked a lot about data use in the football in the football side of our operations but we try to use data try to uh, analyze the way the whole of the club works and you, you, there's no better example than what we've done in the concourses where clearly in a 70 year old stadium where football tradition used to be that you used to turn up at 10 to 3 and leave at 10 to 5 this is not a stadium that's built for rapid dispensing of drink, either before of drink and food, either before or after. And you can go to a modern stadium in the United States, for example, and it's almost like a shopping mall built around a football pitch or a soccer pitch. But if you talk to Christian Kent, who runs the stadium and runs the concessions, or Andy, who's here tonight, you know, he you you, you, you can say how much. What was our take? And he'll tell you, it's £1.76 ahead. We now know, because we have invested in point of sales um, systems, we now know where inventory is running out. So there will be people running around with extra pasties to block 17 because we're running out and we've got too many in block 12. And I just think it's a fantastic example of how doing that helps the club generate more revenue, makes it better for the fans. And uh, it's just, I think, a great example of how the use of data, the use of electronic systems is not just to improve performance on the pitch, but it's to improve the fan experience and to improve the financial state of the club. Excellent. hope that answered, Nick, some of your questions there. Um, we're, we're getting close to the end of the hour, um, and we've still got loads of these to go through. And uh, if you've seen me looking at my phone, it's because I've been told that a lot of the questions that were submitted into that box over there were very similar to the ones that came in via all the emails. So um, uh, we'll go through a couple more, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, but I hope it's been enlightening so far. So this is, again, open to everybody. And it's a question that's coming from Andy, uh, who says, plans for Harper's Football Centre and first team training ground. What, what is the overall plan for that, for that area? OK, um, so first of all, I think um, underline a point I made earlier that um, the opportunity came around for um, the last year to, to um, make some big acquisitions. And they don't, these are kind of things that just don't happen. They, they happen probably once in 10, 15 years, and we're in a position to be able to um, move forward. And that was obviously the uh, acquisition of the, the, the um, ice rink land. And secondly, um, what was goals and now is Harper's. We took a position on the goal site, as it was, that that could be run as a, an ongoing concern because it does generate us revenue. So we, we net... Um, a few hundred thousand pounds a year just from that site. So it made sense to acquire it just to be able to continue the revenue drive that we've talked about previously. But undoubtedly, it does have a long-term play for us. The land is adjacent to the existing training pitches, and in time, we would see the opportunity to be able to merge in some way the facilities that we've got there. But as we found with the Brickfields project, that takes time, it takes planning. We would need to think about what do we want there and what you know what is the long-term aspiration of it. So um, certainly provides us with an opportunity. We don't have a time scale on it, but it's definitely within our plans. To follow that up, and you alluded to it slightly earlier, Andrew, but we've had a, a, quite a few questions that came in regarding developments. Graham was one of them, uh, Josh another, and it was about the Mayflower Quarter as well. So you have kind of already touched on it. But again, just in a little bit more detail, what are the plans going forward for that area of land that we call the Mayflower Quarter going forward as well? Um, 
Yes, I think um, Simon's talked about concessions. Uh, we've talked about things like um, hospitality. We've talked about fan zones. And I think um, relatively short term, the opportunity of that land will be to use it um, to enhance revenue, enhance experience, and uh, to be able to provide a better experience for supporters. Long term, um, I think there's been lots of questions, haven't there, around capacity. There's been lots of questions about how do we develop um, the stadium, et cetera. And there's numbers of considerations, uh, a n number of considerations there, access, egress, how do you get people in, uh, you know, retail store, um, loads of pieces in a jigsaw that need to be pulled together. So again, I got to kind of reiterate the point that the the land acquisition allows us to be able to um, think about and put in place a plan and sequence everything in order that we have, uh, are able to look at um, not just a two or three year future, use the land wisely for two or three years, yes, but look at what does that land look in 10 and 20 years time. Okay, um, we will finish things off with this final question that's come in from Sharon. Um, there's been a, a lot of talk obviously about um, plans, the five-year plan, the mission, investments in players in different areas of uh, around Home Park, etc. Um, but Sharon Williams asks that, Simon, you've talked about uh, additional investment being needed to be able to carry out this vision. What is the plan for this? The mission does look great, Sharon says, but how are we going to pay for it? Uh, okay, let, let me just back up a little bit before I answer the question. Um, when I became chairman, I said that I thought that, and we announced the uh, original mission, I said that I thought that my resources and Jane's resources together could take us, I should say they're joint resources, everything's, everything's in the joint again. <laughs> <laughs> What's hers is mine, is that right? What's right? <laughs> mine is hers, it's all Jane's. Um, <laughs> I said that our resources could take us to the championship, but probably not beyond. You know, we invested those resources in the way that um, David said, building up the infrastructure, improving the fan experience. The fans have responded magnificently by filling the stadium. We've invested in human capital by having the, you know, the coaching staff that has enabled us to outperform our football budget. Uh, so I think we are now in a position where we can compete in the bottom half of the championship with the human resources, the infrastructure that we have. If we're gonna achieve our five-year mission, we need to continue to improve the human resources in the club, on the coaching staff, and we need to continue to improve the infrastructure. I, I'm not used to going to Premier League and former Premier League grounds. I'm a lower league fan, <laughs> or I have been. <laughs> until now, and it's just eye-opening, going to Coventry on Tuesday, going to West Brom, going to Watford, the facilities that they have for their fans, the capacity that, that they have. And of course, that's without looking at the training centers that they have, the academy facilities that they have. Uh, we need all of that if we are going to be competing successfully in the top half of the championship. My resources can't take us there. <laughs> uh, Jane won't let me. Um, so we are looking for new investors. We've been very public about it. We've been looking for over a year, uh, nearly two years. We had um, the initial attempt with Argyle Green, who remain uh, uh, very supportive shareholders, but not at the level that we'd hoped they would be and not at the level that we need. So we need new investors who are prepared to help us do exactly what I just described invest in infrastructure, invest in the playing squad, invest in the human capital at the club. So we've embarked, you won't be surprised that we have had a fairly rigorous process. Uh, Paul and uh, David have developed um, what's called an information memorandum, which is a description of the club. It's a description of where we've come. It's a, a fairly detailed uh, uh, laying out of our financial position, our financial records. It's a fairly detailed laying out of our strategy. And we've appointed um, somebody, a consultant that we're close to, have been close to for a number of years, who's going to act as our agent in basically marketing Plymouth Argyle as an investment opportunity 
to interested parties. They've already begun that process. They've already sent out the information memorandum to a small number of them. And the next stage will be to talk to those people to see if they're still interested and really, really importantly, to see if their values align with ours, uh, align with those of our fans, those of our club, and that they are aligned with the strategy that we've outlined and that we've talked to you about, not just tonight, but in public. Um, it's almost inevitable that over the next you know, five to 10 years, they will end up taking control of the club. But I want to delay that as long as possible. I want uh, to stay as chairman. I want to stay in control for as long as I possibly can. But th there is a possibility that sometime in the future I'll step down. But this is not attempting to find an investor to take the club off my hands. This is an attempt to find an investor with whom I can partner, the board can partner, and you, the fans, can partner in helping us achieve the mission that we've talked about over, over the next five years. So it's going to be hard because uh, people who share our values, who share our view of how football clubs should be run, who share our belief about the appropriate mission for this club, uh, are rare. So we're going to try very hard to find them. Uh, but uh, it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to take just a few days. But uh, we'll keep you in touch with how progress is going. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Um, and thank you very much to everybody who submitted questions and everybody that's been here this evening and, of course, watched at home on Argyle TV. I hope we've uh, managed to answer as many of those questions as we, as we can. There have been so many submitted, it's difficult to get through all of them, but um, I think we gave a good gist and overview there, which is superb. So um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for watching. Just want to say a massive thanks as well to the panel here. So to David Ray, to Paul Byrne, to Andrew Parkinson, Neil Jusnip, and of course, Simon Hallett as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Feel free to... Help yourself for teas and coffees. I think the bar is still open as well. So if not, then uh, apologies. <laughs>